Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. And joining me to get you ready for NFL Week 17 action is Ed Fang, founder of The Power Rank. You can follow him on Twitter at The Power Rank. Ed, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. So it was fun to chat and looking forward to a pretty big weekend of football, man. It's hard to believe we only have two weeks left in the regular season and then we're full bore into the playoffs. Yes. And it feels like there's been multiple seasons within this season, because right now I feel like we are in the COVID season of this. And actually this is the first thing that I want to ask you about. You're an analytics guy. So um, how have you had to adjust your numbers or what has the impact of COVID been on the way that you um, pick games? Yeah, well, I, I got to be honest, it's been pretty tough. Uh, last year, throughout the whole COVID season, it was obviously like a little different environment because we kind of had these issues all year round. My model was pretty good and actually never been better last year in terms of some of the air metrics that I use. Uh, it hasn't quite as been as good this year. And I just feel like recently, you know, when you when you have – uh, you know, uh, Taysom Hill and, and Trevor Simeon both go down, you know, I moved my number for that. It's, it's just I didn't move it enough, right? And it, you know, I, I try to make adjustments for quarterback positions. I do make adjustments for the quarterback positions. It is, uh, it's something I need to get better at in the off season. Um, but yeah, no, I, I gotta be honest. It's, it's been a pretty tough time of year right now to be, be quantitative about this stuff. Um, you know, we'll talk about some of that in, in some of these games. Um, but it, it is, uh, you know, we always have a small sample size with football and, you know, you're talking about trying to evaluate Ian book, a rookie that's never played before in the NFL. And, and uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do. So I think there's a lot of subjectiveness that does come into it. And in terms of betting, like, you know, I mean, I didn't bet that game on Monday night and I think you just got to use your best judgment. um, Look at the market for, for other indications of where to go and uh, hope for the best. And let's look at an outlier, the Detroit Lions, a team that is 10 and five against the spread on the season, one of the best in the NFL. And when you look at who is the worst, you've got Jaguars, Jets, Giants, Lions, Texans, we're looping them in together. But all of a sudden, this Lions team is performing significantly better than expectations. So once again, from an analytics standpoint, yeah, we've got a small sample size, outliers do exist, but how do you sort of uh, compute that? Yeah, so I think the Lions are a great example because we had a game earlier this season where Tim Boyle started because Jared Goff was hurt. The markets made about a three-point move away. Uh, you know, my numbers in the markets agreed, and then the markets made about a three-point move. I thought that seemed kind of small, but that was a game against Cleveland. Uh, Detroit covered actually pretty easily. I think that was a time of year in which Cleveland and, and Baker Mayfield was dealing with three simultaneous injuries at once, uh, but playing through it. So, you know, I made the same adjustment uh, this week. I, I mentioned to members of my site, three doesn't seem like enough going from, I think golf has been great this year. Uh, he's really held that team together. He literally has zero weapons on offense, you know, zero weapons that you really want to say, you know, this guy's a real NFL stud, right? But he's putting it together, you know, throwing to DeAndre Swift and, and TJ Hawkinson, or I think Hawkinson's out, but uh, he's been good. Like their pass offense by my adjusted success rate has, has been kind of startlingly good. So when he went down to boil, I thought three wasn't quite enough. You know, it ends up that Detroit was good enough to make it that a game. And that was also a tough game, too, because can you talk anyone into making Atlanta a, more than a seven point favorite against anyone? I think that's a tough sell as well. So, um, yeah, I think that just points to the difficulties. Uh, I think the adjustment should have been more, uh, even though, but I did make it three. So I think I had Atlanta as about a six and a half point favorite. Uh, Detroit did cover that. So, I'm not saying I made the right call at all. It did work out in my favor for that particular game. But I think that does illustrate the difficulties of uh, what quantitative people like myself are going through right now. The Atlanta Falcons are a running joke for myself because no matter the narrative, it's like, oh, Atlanta is only giving six and a half. Or in the case (laughs) this week, it's like, oh, Atlanta is getting 
14 and a half and it's like this big shiny object it's like yeah. atlanta is always there they're either undervalued or oh my god how can you be getting so much but as a long time sports better i stay away from atlanta because there is nothing that is consistent about anything that they do right and and particularly this week being a 14 point dog against buffalo a team that has really struggled in one score games. Uh, I think the last I checked, they were 0 and 5 or whatnot. So there's this kind of narrative that they're like eking out these games against uh, kind of similar competition, but really blowing out teams that are uh, not in the same level as they are. So I think that's kind of enhancing that spread as well. Um, but it, it's, it's hard to take in the points because they're, they're not a good football team. And that's actually a great segue to a quick recap of last week. Uh, I'm going to give us a one and a half in O in a non-contest. So early on, we were on the Dolphins plus three pre-COVID. All of a sudden, that switched seven points. That came in our favor. That was just good fortune. But even looking at that line, irregardless of it, we liked the Dolphins. And then I pegged the, the Bills at two and a half. But what we said is, listen, there's so much COVID stuff going on. We're going to wait to place this bet. Gabe Davis and Cole Beasley go out. And the number actually goes down to one. And I look there on Sunday and I'm like, well, crap. I didn't get the best of the number. I'm going right. to wait to jump on them in live betting. What happens? Bills go up 7 nothing. That number shoots to minus 2.5. I ended up not even getting on the Bills, despite the fact that I love the yeah. Bills. I'm going to give myself a half win more for anybody else who played it. And then our no bet was the Ravens line was sitting there at two and a half. And we said, let's hold on and see who's quarterback. It becomes Josh Johnson. And immediately that becomes a no bet because no one in their right mind is going to go in there. And I believe this should be called the Mike Glennon rule. And Josh Johnson's part of that. If either of those two quarterbacks are starting, just stay away. Yep. Absolutely. My number is actually like Buffalo outright in that game against New England. I think New England's a good team, but I think Buffalo is better. All right. So let's get to NFL week 17. And we got three games that we're going to quickly jam about And one of these games is actually off the board sort of because of the quarterback COVID issue. We've got the Colts looking at five and a half. They're laying taking on the Raiders. This is off for most books. And this game is interesting because the Raiders Two and six against the spread their last eight, and they're a team who is notorious for fading down the stretch. And there's been so much turmoil with them. I don't find them trustworthy in the least bit. You look over the Colts, one of the best teams against the spread, 10 and five. Uh, does Carson Wentz play, or is it Sam Ellinger who's yep. played, who's thrown no passes? So once again, Ed, here comes that number of what are we going to do with? And the thing that I noticed about the Colts' success recently, their defense has allowed 17 points or fewer in five of the last six games. So irregardless of who the quarterback is, my confidence in the Colts would actually be on their defense. What is your thoughts on this game? Yeah, I've been down on the Colts all year. Uh, the reason is because I don't think they can throw the ball. They're 22nd when I look at adjusted passing success rate on offense. That's a direct indictment of Carson Wentz. You can kind of, I mean, how many how many yards did he throw for against the Pats two weeks ago in a win? Um, and then, you know, my numbers, you know, you did mention that they have held teams to a, a, a 17 points or fewer. Uh, but the underlying metrics don't like them as much. They're 24th when I look at passing success rate. So this is a team that my numbers haven't liked all year, and um, I'm definitely going against them here. Uh, the Carson Wentz, I actually liked him. I actually, I would lean towards Las Vegas, even if Wentz were to play. Now, there are scenarios in which he plays. I think like if the NFL changes their rules and the quarantine period gets shorter. Um, but we're looking, I think we're looking at Sam Ellinger most, for the most part. Uh, you know, this was at seven and a half when I first looked at it, it got to six and a half. I did bet it when the news, uh, of the Wentz situation came out. I completely agree with you. I don't really trust this Las Vegas team. It's been bad recently. Uh, Derek Carr was a little bit dinged up in the ribs in the last game, but he does look like he's going to play Darren Waller practice this week, which, which is a little bit encouraging. Um, but then you also have uh, Casey Hayward, the cornerback that's been good for them all year is, is probably out of this. I think this is a lot of points. And uh, I like Las Vegas here. Cool. Moving on to 
uh, what is arguably the best and highest profile game of the week. The Cowboys also laying five and a half at home, taking on the Cardinals and the Cowboys and NFL best 12 and three against the spread on the season. But here's the thing. They are coming off a blowout win of all blowout wins. Typically that's a big indicator for us of, Hey, team blows out another team. We want to be on the other side. And on the flip side, when a team gets blown out, we love being on the other side. But there's a big yeah. challenge here. The Cardinals are sliding. They've lost three in a row, all his favorites. So there's terrible timing on this right now. And to yes into this even one point further, it's about Cliff Kingsbury, who is notoriously a terrible second half coach. And I have to give credit to Josh Weinfuss from ESPN for this stat. So at Texas Tech, uh, the Red Raiders were 27 and 15 in games one through seven, eight and 25 thereafter. At the Cardinals, 15 and five in games one through seven, eight and 18 the rest of the season. So overall, he's 42 and 20 in the first seven games of the year and 16 and 43 thereafter. How much stock do we put into this? I don't know, but I don't exactly have faith in Cliff Kingsbury right now, yeah. even though the Cardinals, a team who has been significantly better on the road, 5-0 and against the spread as an underdog this year, but Cowboys are coming in, having covered four in a row. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a buy low spot for on, on the Cardinals. Um, and uh, you mentioned Dallas, their big win last week against Washington. You didn't mention that, you know, that was not only a big win, but they started a fight on the other sideline. I think that's uh, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of a buy low spot on, on Arizona. Um, you know, they don't have DeAndre Hopkins on offense, but, you know, the underlying metrics in terms of their passing success rate in their last two games without him have been have been pretty good albeit against some pretty bad pass defenses. And, um, you know, Dallas, you know, we, we know what their offense can do. Their defense has been better than certainly that, that I have expected. Um, so I think they're a good team. While I do think there's a little bit of value on the side with Arizona, the bet I really like here is the over. I think there's some 51s out here still. My model likes it at 55 and it's been interesting this week. I'm still, you know, the, the totals model is in, uh, in the NFL is a work in progress. And a lot of my totals are high this week, basically because there's wind everywhere <laughs> along the East Coast and all through the Midwest. And, and uh, there, there's a need to be cautioned about, you know, betting overs in those games, but not in Dallas and not in a game in AT&T Stadium that has two high powered offenses. Uh, Arizona's defense was better earlier in the season, but they've gotten some injuries now. Marco Wilson, the rookie, might not play. Uh, and I think these are two high-powered offenses. I think these are two of the best offenses in the league. You might not believe in Cliff Kingsbury. I do believe in Kyler Murray. I think he's, uh, I think he's a pretty good quarterback. I'll, I definitely believe in Dak. So I like the over, over 51 in this game. And I want to reiterate something that you said, because it's very important. It is wind that is a big factor on totals, not necessarily precipitation. You look last week at the Seahawks bears tilt, where I believe the number was at like 41, 41 and a half. And everyone yeah. sees the image of here comes the snow plow plow in the field. And everyone's like, boom, hammer this under, but it is the wind that matters yep. more than the precipitation. And I would really look out for that this week. I saw checking the weather when I first looked at these numbers, a lot of 16 to 20 mile per hour winds all along the East Coast and through the Midwest. All right. Last game we have here, we're actually going to Monday night. The Pittsburgh Steelers at home, three and a half point underdogs to the Cleveland Browns. You're going to lay a little bit of juice. And what's interesting here, Ed, the Steelers, the look headline on this was Steelers minus one. So we've seen a four and a half point correction here. Steelers coming off an absolute blowout loss. And quite frankly, the Steelers have looked like crap for the majority of the year. I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm a Steelers fan. And really for me, this comes down to one thing. This is Ben Roethlisberger's lastly last, last game in front of the Steelers fans at Heinz Field. And they're getting three and a half points. The Steelers, a team that's 2-0 against a spread as a home dog on the year. And to yes in this again, the last five Browns games, six points or less, four of them 
three points or less. We've got a low total here at 41. So we've got a division matchup, low total. Ben Roethlisberger in his last game in Pittsburgh. Give me the Pittsburgh Steelers getting three and a half. Yeah, absolutely. My numbers would agree with you. I like Cleveland to win by about a point in this game. So kind of splitting that difference between what the look ahead was and where the market is now. Um, you know, you mentioned how bad Pittsburgh was last week and no one can disagree with that. They're still on track to be at least 500, uh, which is kind of crazy. Uh, a lot of people talk about how Tomlin's never had a, a losing record. And he, you know, if he goes one and one, he will, uh, he will have kept that streak up. So my numbers certainly see value, uh, agree with you there. Um, hey, we got to remember, Cleveland probably should have won that game against Green Bay last week. Uh, a couple, uh, you know, Baker threw a bunch of picks, but, you know, they were, they were able to move the ball. They were able to run the ball. Uh, kind of a terrible, uh, I think, non-call on defensive holding at the end on the pick that actually ended the game. Um, and my numbers are actually higher on Cleveland's uh, defense. Uh, they're a top 10 defense when I look at adjusted passing success rate. With all that being said, I mean, I think y- y- your instincts on this game kind of depend on what you think you're going to get out of Pittsburgh. I feel like they've been very up and down. Uh, it's a terrible start to the season, but yet we're we're in we're in week 17 and they are seven seven and one. So uh, a lot of volatility there. Um, I don't know what Ben I don't know what ben, Big Ben has left in the tank, uh, but I think uh, any kind of bet has to be relying on what you think where they where they're going to be this week. Here's the thing. Ben hasn't entirely been the problem. Yes, there's some games sure. like when they played Cincinnati previously where you're like, oh my goodness, where's Dwayne Haskins at? But then there's other games where Ben is clearly the best player on offense for the Steelers. The challenge right. is their offensive line, complete trash in their defense, which was supposed to be elite yep. coming in absolutely terrible when the defense is terrible and you're down 14 nothing before the game even starts and then you've got no offensive line you watch Najee Harris run the ball I don't think he's actually had a hole the entire season right and I think you bring up a really important point that I think all the listeners should really uh absorb like defense is very volatile in the NFL offense is pretty stable like how you throw the ball pretty stable year to year pretty stable in season not so for defense. And, um, you know, we've seen Pittsburgh have one of the best defenses in the NFL last year. I kind of had some concerns about them just because there was a bunch of turnover in the secondary at the start. And, you know, they look like a pretty average unit. Uh, other examples, you know, Buffalo's defense has been fantastic this year, but that tends to be pretty volatile. No Davis White for the rest of the season. So, you know, that that's a team that you can see regress on that side of the ball. And then a team like Green Bay, whose defense has been up and down. They kind of look average in my numbers right now. But if they get Jair Alexander back, maybe they can be a good enough unit to propel them to the Super Bowl. So a lot of volatility on that side of the ball. Definitely something to keep in mind when you're betting on these games. Yeah, your numbers are seeing the same thing I saw in Green Bay because Nick Chubb absolutely torched them. I can't exactly mm-hmm. say I feel all warm and fuzzy on Green Bay being the best team right. in the league after watching that game. Right, exactly. And then the, on the other side, like any team that's played the Colts and gotten run over by Jonathan Taylor is, is like the opposite feeling too, right? Like I don't think Taylor can continue to um, – to pull off all these long runs. I know he had one last game. Um, the other thing actually about that Vegas Indy game, uh, both, both of the Colts guards, offensive guards uh, were out the last game and their rushing success rate, rate was really low in that game. I, I don't have it in front of me, but it was not what we usually expect out of that Colts offense. So um, again, uh, part of my reason for liking Vegas in that game is uh, injuries on the Colts line and just the fact that I don't, I don't think Jonathan Taylor can continue to break off all these big plays. So Ed, quick recap on my end. I'm on the Steelers plus three and a half. What about you? Yeah. So uh, I like Las Vegas. I got it at plus six and a half. Obviously a lot of that has to do with the Colts quarterback situation. And then my favorite bet of the week is Arizona, Dallas over 51. I, I don't think that number is going to be around until kickoff. Uh, I think you have two higher powered offenses in a perfect environment for them to, to uh, get a lot of points. Ed really enjoy jamming with you. Where can everybody connect? Yeah. Get with me at the power That is my site for uh, data driven sports betting information. Uh, the real place is to sign up for the email newsletter. Uh, I provide short write-ups on, on games that I've bet. And then uh, also curate 
tips and news sports betting related uh, from other people in the industry as well. So check that out at thepowerrank.com. And I want to hear from you. What is on your week 17 card and what is your best bet of the week? You can hit me up on Twitter or Instagram at Rob Cressy. Also make sure to tag at covers. And remember, you want to be a sharp, don't be a square with your bankroll, be disciplined with your money management.